Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Hello everyone, today's video is on Gary Mark Gilmore. Gary's case got a lot of recognition because he became the first person to be executed in the state of Utah after the death penalty was reinstated in 1976. He was also the only person executed in Utah in the year 1977. Gary Mark Gilmore was born on December 4, 1940 in Texas to Frank and Betty Gilmore. Gary's father was an alcoholic criminal who had other wives and families he did not support or take care of, so it came as a surprise he even married Mormon follower Bessie and stayed with her and their four kids. Gary's birth name was actually Faye Kaufman, but the family left Texas to avoid the law, so Bessie had given him the new name, Gary Mark, while the whole family changed their last name from Kaufman to Gilmore. The family frequently moved because of always being on the run, and his father had a habit of physically assaulting him and his three brothers. In 1948, at the age of eight, the family finally settled in Portland, Oregon. It has been documented that Gary was a very bright and artistic child with an IQ of 133, but chose the life of crime like his father. As a young teen, his criminal career began. In 1952, Gary dropped out of high school in the ninth grade and would always run away from home and casually come back home whenever he felt like it. At the young age of 14, he was smart enough to start his very own car theft ring, but not smart enough to avoid getting caught because while stealing a car, he got busted and was sent to McLaren's Reform School for Boys in Woodburn, Oregon. He was released in 1955 at the age of 15, and of course, not being rehabilitated, he turned back to a life of crime. In 1960, he was sent to Oregon State Correctional Facility for a larceny charge, and a year later, he was sentenced again for driving with an open container of alcohol and for not having a license. At around this time, Gary found his original birth certificate with the name Faye Kaufman, and he got extremely upset thinking he was lied to his whole life and that Frank was not his real father. Before his mother could explain anything, he walked out on the family and it was years before they had a relationship again. Gary had once stated that that was the reason he did not get along with his father, but it did seem like they had deeper issues even before that incident. In 1962, while in jail for driving without a license, Gary was told by a guard that his father had died from lung cancer. Despite their rocky relationship, Gary was extremely hurt and tried to unalive himself in prison. In 1964, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison because he was a repeat offender. While serving time at the Oregon State Pen, a psychiatrist diagnosed Gary with antisocial personality disorder, and he was also diagnosed with having intermittent psychotic decompensation. Gary served eight years out of his 15-year sentence, and he was released early in 1972 with conditions. He was supposed to attend school and spend time in a halfway house, but he never did this and ended up getting arrested again a month later for armed robbery. While serving time in prison for armed robbery, his violent behavior got so bad in prison that he was transferred to a prison in Illinois. He was paroled in April of 1976 and was able to live with his cousin Brenda in Utah. For the first time in his life, he got an honest paying job working at a shoe repair shop and then at an insulation company. He even began a relationship with Nicole Barrett Baker, who was a 19-year-old with two children. Mind you, Gary was 35 at the time when he started dating Nicole. Unfortunately, Gary left his honest paying jobs and turned back to a life of crime. He was also very aggressive and would physically assault Nicole on occasion. As previously mentioned, Gary was paroled in April and just a mere three months later in July, he committed his first murder. On July 19, 1976, Gary left his car at a repair shop to be fixed and later went into a gas station with the intention of robbing it. He tied up employee Max Jensen and despite Max complying with every demand, Gary still fatally shot him in the back of the head. The very next night, on July 20th, Gary went to a motel and killed the motel manager Benny Bushnell. Again, Benny complied with all demands and was still shot with the same 22 caliber pistol used to kill Max the night before. Sadly, both men had newborns and families, so their families were left all alone over a simple petty theft that could have completely had a different ending. After killing Benny, Gary tried to dispose of the pistol and accidentally shot himself in the hand, which left a blood trail to the car repair shop he had left his car a day earlier. 
The mechanic, Michael Simpson, who witnessed Gary hiding the gun in the bushes, saw the bloody hand and was able to hear about a shooting at a local motel on the police scanner. He put two and two together and wrote down Gary's car registration and called the police. Gary's cousin Brenda also turned him in after he phoned her for painkillers and bandages. Gary was soon apprehended without a fight a few months later in October of 1976. Gary's trial began at the Provo Courthouse on October 5, 1976. Although he was responsible for two murders, he was only tried for Benny's murder because there were no witnesses for the Max Jensen murder. The trial lasted two days and the jury came back with a recommendation of the death penalty. When asked which of the two methods of execution available in the state of Utah he wanted, firing squad or hanging, he replied by saying, I'd prefer to be shot. Gary waived his rights to appeals and his execution was set for the next month on November 15, 1976 at 8 a.m. Despite Gary wanting to die and admitting to his crimes, he did not die on November 15th because there were multiple stays of execution, all of which were not initiated or wanted by him. Gary's mother Bessie was the first to sue for a stay of execution on his behalf, and in a 5-4 to four decision, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear his mother's claims. The American Civil Liberties Union also petitioned for several stays of execution for Gary. The very last day of execution was overturned at 7.30 a.m. on Gary's new execution date of January 17, 1977. After the first day of execution, Gary tried to unalive himself on death row, which was a day after he was supposed to be executed. He made another attempt to unalive himself in December as well. With the American Civil Liberties Union representing Gary against his wishes, Gary went on record and said, They always want to get in on the act. I don't think they have ever really done anything effective in their lives. I would like them all, including that group of reverends and rabbis from Salt Lake City, to butt out of my life. This is my death. It's been sanctioned by the courts that I die, and I accept that. The day before execution day, Gary requested a last meal of steak, potatoes, milk, and coffee, but he only drank the milk and coffee. Gary also requested a family gathering that was approved, and Gary's uncle later went on record and said that he smuggled in three bottles of whiskey that Gary drank. The next day, Gary was taken to an abandoned cannery behind the prison since there was no real execution building. He got strapped in, and behind him was a wall full of sandbags to catch the bullets. When they asked him if he had any last words, he replied by saying, Let's do it. A black hood was then placed over his head, and he said, Let the Lord be with you in Latin, and the reverend replied by saying, With your spirit. Gary was executed on January 17, 1977, at 8.07 a.m. Of the five officers in the firing squad, only one was supposed to have the real bullet, but it turned out that Gary had five bullet holes in his clothes. Gary's brother went on record and said, The state of Utah apparently had taken no chances on the morning that had put my brother to death. I also learned that Gary actually requested to have his body donated, and shortly after his death, maybe within a couple of hours, two people received his cornea. My question for you guys, how would you feel if you received an organ from a death row inmate who was executed? After Gary's body was donated, his body was then cremated and scattered from an airplane over Spanish Fork, Utah. Here is a reenactment of Gary Gilmore's execution and it misses important things like his last words, but you kind of get the gist of how he was executed, it's just not as dramatic. The firing squad had been chosen from the dozens of marksmen who volunteered. Each man chose an already loaded rifle. One gun held the traditional blank cartridge. The others held 30 caliber bullets. Regarding State of Utah versus Gary Gilmar, number 6405, warrant State of Utah to the warden of the Utah State Prison. 
The warden of the Utah State Prison is hereby ordered to execute said judgment of death on the 6th day of December 1976 at sunrise in the manner specified by law. The defendant having elected to be executed by shooting. Dated December 1st, 1976, J. Robert Bullock, the judge. May Almighty God absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ready your weapons? And... at 8.07 a.m. Mountain Time, after a 10-year moratorium, the taking of a life for a life began again in the United States. According to opinion polls, that's what about 70% of us want.